Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Python, and then we're going to do a lab uh, in Python. So um, uh, there are lots of different scripting languages out there. Um, Python is, is my personal favorite. Um, uh, it's, it's fairly powerful. It has a lot of nice features. Um, it's a, it's a, you could say, think of it as an object-oriented scripting language. Um, and I'll put object-oriented in quotes because um, well, there, there are different things that you would think about as an object-oriented programming language that you'd want to have. You'd want to have, um, have classes. You'd want to be able to perform inheritance. Um, to be able to reuse code in base classes. And you'd want to be able to have polymorphism so that you can um, uh, override the behavior of uh, base classes in, in, um, in subclasses. And, and Python has these three things. Um, but the thing that I, I kind of like the best about um, object-oriented programming is um, you have, when you have a class, it has private data. And um, uh, you say to the rest of the world, you may not touch this, you may not modify this, and I can maintain state on my own without having to try to figure out if somebody else has um, uh, pulled the rug out from under my feet. Um, and Python doesn't have that. Um, that's, that's sort of referred to as encapsulation. So uh, there's no private data in Python. Um, so if you make a class, all of its data is public. Um, if you're working in PyRosetta uh, and you're working on some of the um, PyRosetta, don't you have access to the private data in the, in the C++ classes, or is that not? Oh, no. Oh, you don't? OK, good. Which can be very frustrating. Very frustrating. Well, if it is more protected, they're not available. If you class something, you can't get protected. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. So that's a, a technical <laughs> detail for another talk that we won't actually have. Um, but the best thing about Python is it's um, it's code that's easy to read. Um, so I have looked at um, m more Perl than I want, which is not very much. Um, and the problem with reading somebody else's Perl script is that you can't. Uh, I don't think you can even read your own Perl script. It's, it's a language meant for, it's like a write-only language. Um, and so, uh, so my, my problem is that I, I like to do things, and it's fun to do them the first time, and it's not as fun the second time. And then the third time, I just get angry, and I don't want to ever do it again. Um, and so I like to reuse my code, and, and Python's a great way for doing that. So um, I've been uh, developing um, like more and more Python code as I go to, to handle um, simple scripting um, tasks that I often do. Uh, and some of the code that I wrote like four years ago, I'm still using. Um, and I don't know how many people can say that, like still using and developing and calling. right? I know how it functions. Um, I can read it. Uh, I don't know if you can do that with Perl. Um, I'm sure there are people who disagree. But, um, but you can actually read, you can read your code. Um, OK, so um, uh, yeah, sure. So encapsulation means private. Private data. Yeah, everything's public. The, the closest thing to private data is uh, um, like the, uh, so you can say, uh, you can begin your variable names with um, underscore. And that's like a convention where people are like, oh, if it begins with underscore, I shouldn't mess with that. But you can mess with it if you want to. The closest thing to, um, to, to actual privacy is that if you have a base class function and you override it, in the uh, derived class, you can still maintain a pointer to the base class function. And the details are kind of like sketchy. But that, that pointer is like, I'm um, oh, sorry, the base class can maintain a, a pointer to its own function. That's the, that's the cr crucial detail there. Um, it's, a, it's a really, like, I've never used that. I was just Googling around for like privacy in Python. I found like the one exception. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, this edge case. But in general, everything is public. And it, it gets a, uh, that's, there's some, uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, it, means, it makes it just a bit harder to, to maintain code, because then it, you'd have to worry, is somebody else changing my data from underneath me? Um, OK, so uh, what, what are the common tasks uh, uh, you would use for um, Python? Um, for me, I like to um, uh, use Python a lot in job control. So um, if I have to run jobs, uh, then I, and you often need to like set up the directories in which they run, um, put input files in certain places, uh, and then bring lots of different inputs together, and then submit a command or, or create a command uh, that then will execute in the shell, uh, and, and say something like b sub, which is like this uh, uh, command for submitting a job to a queue, um, and actually figuring out you know what the command line should be is is kind of tedious. Um, and it takes enough time where 
writing a script to figure out that command once takes less time than figuring out that command every time you want to run a job. And so I, I use Python a, a whole lot for um, controlling my job. So launching jobs, managing the, the outputs of jobs once those jobs have completed, um, and then uh, um, sort of as a secondary thing, like analyzing the output for jobs. So I have a lot of scripts for, say, doing, um, I do a lot of uh, protein design profiling and, and um, analysis. So I look at um, sequence recovery. So I have scripts for, say, taking two sets of PDBs and comparing the sequence recovery rate, or the sequence identity rate between those, those PDBs. Um, doing it, uh, dividing it into, like, say, the total sequence recovery rate, and then um, the sequence recovery rate based on each amino acid type, sequence recovery rate based on uh, the burial of all the residues. And so um, uh, a lot of these things mean, like, opening up a PDB uh, and then figuring out complex information about it, like whether a residue is, you know, how many neighbors that residue has, so geometrical information. This is not stuff you can do with grep. You cannot grep to figure out whether um, uh, a single residue has like 10 or 20 different neighbors within a 10 angstrom sphere. Um, so that's something that, that Python is, is powerful enough to let you do. Um, uh, in general, um, uh, I wish I had gotten this advice when I was a graduate student, that if, if you're interested in running jobs, um, you should think about it as programming. Uh, that is, this is something that I want the computer to do. And you could sit there and type in your command for like B sub so to launch your job. But um, uh, there's only going to be, I, I don't think you're ever going to find a case where you will launch a job once. Um, and so if you're going to do something more than once, you may as well write a program to do it. Um, and, and especially in Rosetta, um, you know, typically you run thousands of jobs, um, and doing that um, manually on the command line is a bad idea. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about in this in this lecture? Uh, I'm going to go over um, the uh, the language features of Python, um, and you start with a new language, figuring out what the data representation is. Um, I'll talk about the primitives, talk about strings. So it's, uh, Python is a great language for dealing with strings, way better than C++ is. Um, uh, I'll talk about the tuple data type, the lists, and dictionaries. Between um, uh, lists and dictionaries, you can do um, lots and lots of stuff. Um, they're really powerful things. Uh, um, I'll talk about functions, um, the, dec the syntax for declaring classes. I'm not going to go deeply into classes, though. Um, and then for the sake of uh, the lab that, that's associated with this, lecture, or this um, brief intro here, uh, I'm going to talk about... Uh, how you can do file manipulation and, and uh, uh, string manipulation. Okay, so the primitive data types in, in Python are um, integers and floats. Um, and so, uh, so you can declare a new integer by saying uh, myval1, for instance, that would be the name of your new variable, equals 5. So this is sort of a declaration and an initialization statement all in one. Um, and the type of myval is going to be given by the right-hand side of this argument. So then you can say um, myval2 equals 5 point, which is another way of saying um, this is a floating point number, uh, and so this would be then a floating point number. Um, and so you, could, you can compare the difference between um, uh, an integer versus a floating point division operation by, by printing out this. Um, so you say myval divided by 2, myval1 divided by 2 versus myval2 divided by 2 will give you um, either 2 for integer division or 2.5 for floating point division. Um, and these are, these are the two primitives, or at least the two that I'm most aware of. Um, the syntax I'm using here, by the way, is um, uh, this is the Python command line. So if you're sitting at your shell and you just type the word Python and hit enter, it'll bring up these three um, carrots, and you can just start pounding away. And so you can interactively uh, script in Python. You can also write... Python files and then execute them, which is what you're going to be doing in this lab. Okay, so um, uh, strings are, are pretty cool. They're, uh, you just say, uh, if you've got some, some variable, you, or, or if you want to create a, a string, you say, my string equals this is a string, and you enclose it in quotes. You can use double quotes. You can use single quotes. Um, if you use uh, single or double quotes, then you can put a single quote in the middle, and it won't mess things up. If you use... Um, uh, single quotes, then you could double quotes in the middle, and that won't mess things up. Um, if you uh, want to use both, um, there are escape characters. I'm not going to cover that. Um, the weird thing about strings is that they're immutable. Um, so 
strings are strings are like arrays, right? Um, you have a, a character one, two, three, four. Actually, in Python, it's zero, one, two, three, um, and uh, and so you can you can sort of ask for the entry in a string, but you can't assign a value into an entry in the string. So you can't um, change an existing string. Um, so that's a little weird. You can, however, um, change where a variable points. And so you can say, my string equals this new thing. So you construct a new string on the right-hand side of this, where you get the substring up to 5, and then the value a, and then the substring after 5 to the end. Um, and that would be a way to replace um, uh, this is a string with this, is, this as a string. Um, OK, so. Um, uh, that brings up um, subscripting, which is kind of fun in, in Python. So if you have your string, you can say, um, uh, the, with the, within this, uh, this bracket symbol here, um, x and then a colon and then y. And then you have like sort of all these different options for what, what could be in x and, one, and y. So x is the, um, the starting index. If you don't give an x, then that means 0. So you can just refer to, say, the, um, everything up to um, position 5 without giving uh, an x, right? Um, if it's a positive number, then it means starting from the left side of the string. Um, so, so this would be 0, 1, 2. So you could say um, <coughs> 1, and that would mean counting from the left. If you give a negative number, that means counting from the right. So this is position negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And that's pretty sweet, especially if you want to say, like, I've got this file name, and I want to know if it ends with .pdb. You can just look at the last four characters in the string and see if those are .pdb. And so you just say negative 4 colon, and that would give you uh, the last, like the dot in the extension. So I love that in Python. Um, uh, y, then, for this, this x colon y thing, that's the, that's the one past the ending index. Um, so if, you, if you're look, looking at um, uh, blank colon 5, uh, then that means that you'll get the first um, five entries that is going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then, um, so that would be THIS space um, in this case. Uh, yeah, so the, the five, so when, when you index from 0, um, uh, five would refer to the sixth position in this array. It's, it's that funny um, computer science way of counting. Okay, so if you, if you um, don't give a Y, then that means N or the length of the string. So um, for instance, when you, when you get this substring, you go from 6, which is like the S here, um, uh, all the way to the end, because so, I didn't provide a Y. If you get a positive number, that means counting from the right. And a negative number, that means counting from the left. Um, so here's some substring examples. So, um, so let's say I've got uh, my string, um, and you say 4 score and 7 years ago, assign that to my, scr my string. Okay, so, and I'll just put a little ruler here so that you can see um, the indices of, of what's going on. Okay, so if I say um, my string uh, <coughs> 0 to 4, uh, what do I get? Four. Yeah. Uh, I should have chosen a different string, but you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> 4 is what you get when you say 0, colon, and then the numeral 4. Um, Yes, uh, F O U R. All right. So, what if I say uh, colon four? Is going to be the same thing. Yeah. So, um, so you see that R has an index of three. Mm -hmm. So when you give it four, then it um, it stops at three. So it goes up to that number. Yeah. It's like. Up to, but not quite there. Yeah. All right. What if I say um, four colon ten? It's a uh, yeah space score. There's a little space there. Sweet. And how about um, negative three colon? A go. Sweet. Um, I think that's all I got on that. OK, so um, uh, other data things? So um, one, one fun thing about Python or um, uh, wild is that there's no strict typing. 
right? So you don't say, when you declare a variable, you don't say int my int. You just say my int equals 5. And you could say something um, crazy like my int equals 4 score and 7 years ago. That's probably not a good idea, but you can totally do it. Um, so in C++, you say int 4, 4. If you say int 5, and then you initialize it with 5.0 if you try to give it um, uh, a double here, then that will give you a compiler warning and saying, like, I'm going to cast this to an integer. So you should be aware of that. That's, that may lose some precision. That may not be what you intended to, to program. If you say um, uh, int 6, the number following 5, that gives you a compiler error. This will not compile at all. Python says um, 5, 5.0. Yeah, I'll do that. 5, whatever, man. I do what I want. Fine. OK, so um, uh, right. oh, and the last thing is that um, uh, this is fine sort of as it is. So this, is, this declares 5 and then sets it to a value. And this reassigns 5. So it starts as a float, and then it becomes a string. That's cool. Not, uh, Python doesn't care that you've just changed the type of your, your variable in the middle of it. Um, OK, let's move on to, to tuples. Um, they're uh, short, immutable lists. So um, uh, you can't change them once you create them. Um, but, uh, but you can kind of treat them like arrays. Uh, you can iterate across them. Um, there's no strict typing. Uh, which maybe isn't a surprise from the previous slide. So you don't have to have uh, a tuple where you have all the same type in each of the positions of the tuple. Um, so for instance, uh, if you say tuple equals, and then in um, uh, parentheses, you know, 5.0, uh, the string 12, and the numeral 1, um, Python's totally happy to let you do that. Um, so what you've created at this point, tuple, is a, is a three tuple. So it's got three things in it. Um, you can have uh, two tuples. You can have n tuples. Um, uh, I think the, yeah, well, never mind. Um, OK, so, uh, and then you can treat it just like you would an array. So you can say tuple, and then you can uh, use the bracket operator here and get the zeroth element of it, the first element in the list. And that would be 5.0. You can ask for the first one, that, that's a string 12. And you can ask for uh, the, the two elements, and that's, that's the value 1. Um, and then, if you were to say, like, try to reassign it, so if you want to change the, the one element from 12, the string 12, to the string 13, um, that gives you an error. So Python won't let you do that. Um, if you want to extract all the values at one time, you can say x, comma, y, comma, z equals tuple. And then you can ask for the value in x. Um, and that's really convenient as well. Um, one cool thing about um, tuples is that they get around this, this really funny thing, which is that um, in Python, a function can only return um, one object. This is common for most functions, but it's true also of Python. But it can be um, a tuple, uh, and then it can have as many objects you want in that tuple. So uh, that's this like, nice way of getting around this idea that you can only return one thing. Um, so there's often sometimes where you want to like, uh, Say you have a list, and you want to search through that list uh, for an element, and then um, uh, compute a value and, as and associate it with that element. Um, you can return those two things together as a, uh, by joining them together as a tuple. OK, um, so lists are uh, uh, the most, so I use lists constantly in, in um, Python. Um, they're basically arrays, but you can just think of them as lists. Uh, um, most of the things that you program in Python, you're not um, programming for speed. Sometimes you are, but usually not. Um, so you can just think of this as a list where you can just you know, append to the end of it, um, even though it's going to cost this, create this um, sort of vector uh, copying uh, cost, just like we discussed a, a few days ago. Uh, OK, so you can say my list equals and then open and close square brackets. So this is the syntax for declaring a new list. Um, and you can say append to it the value 5, or you can append to it the value 6 and then append to it the value, uh, which is the string S-E-V-E-N, right? And because there's no strict typing, that's totally leg legitimate. You don't have to have an integer list or um, uh, some other kind of list. You can put anything you want into a list. So you can ask for the value. So list indexing works just like um, string subscripting. So you can say my list um, 0, and, and that will give you the, the first element in this list, 5. Or you can say um, my list, um, and you give it the ask for the the element negative one, and that will give you the last element in the list or seven. Um, you can iterate across a list, so you can say um, uh, 
uh, for item in my list, print item. And in this case, given that we've initialized it this way, it'll print out five, six, and seven. Um, I should maybe introduce the syntax of a for loop here. So you say for, and then you give the variable that you're going to be using for the iteration through the for loop. Um, you will use the word in, and then you uh, provide some iterable data, iteratable data structure, which can be a list, it can be a dictionary, it can be a tuple, um, anything. You, you can actually uh, define a class that uh, has sort of an iteratable feature. That's kind of an advanced topic that I won't cover. And you can iterate across the contents of that class. And then, um, then you have a colon. Um, then in order to, uh, to describe the body of this for loop, you start indenting. Um, and so I like to indent with three spaces. I think I may be one of the few people in the world who does this. But um, uh, I just find it, it makes, it's easy on my eyes. It's not too far out at four spaces or too close at two spaces. Three is just the perfect number of spaces. So that's how I do it. Um, and uh, so anyway, so, um, so I put three spaces here. And then um, uh, I say print item. So this is the print command. And you can just uh, uh, give it the thing that you want to have printed. Um, and then uh, if I wanted to have more in this, in this for loop, then I would um, have to indent to the same level. And then when I stop indenting or when I stop giving in input in the um, Python uh, uh, command line, then uh, it executes the statement. So uh, Python's kind of funny. It, it does this, um, uh, like the scope of this for loop or the extent of it is based on white space, which means that when you look at a Python program, it's really easy to read, right? Because you can't write a Python program that's hard to read. You can't have loops like if they start to get really deep, suddenly stop indenting and go back to the beginning of the line like you can in C++. Right? C++ doesn't care about white space, but humans do. Um, and so it's like really hard. I don't know. That's why we have like so many coding conventions on how to handle white space so that other people can read your code. Um, and Python prevents you from writing code that you can't read, uh, which is pretty sweet. OK. so. Um, uh, right, so here's some, some other for loops. So um, this function range, if you give it an integer, it'll construct a list that goes from 0 up until right before that integer. So I could say for i in range 3. So that would give me, um, that actually produce, produces a list. And then I iterate across all the elements of the list with i. And so that would give me 0, 1, 2. Um, if I have this, this, uh, this new list that I've created, my list, and I say it's a list and it's got the elements 1, 2, 3, um, then I can say for i in range of the length of my list, then print the contents of uh, index i from that list. And that would give me um, the string 1, the string 2, and the string 3. Um, so this is kind of a funny way to do this, right? Um, I get an integer here. But this is constructing a list that's based on the length of that list. So there's kind of uh, there's a little bit of overhead in terms of um, constructing this extra list here. But that's just how Python uh, does its its thing. Um, I give a little plug for X range, which is um, a little more energy. Or I'm sorry, like um, memory efficient. So it doesn't allocate a list. It just yields um, the next uh, index in in the range. Um, but uh, um, that's a little more complicated than what I wanted to cover today. Uh, so the last way you could do it is you could just, uh, if you wanted to have this list but with fewer um, keystrokes, then you could just say i is the value of, of the string in my list for each of the positions. And so you can see that this, gen this, this uh, iteration command produces exactly the same output as the one above it. Um, cool. Um, Right, so range constructs a list from 0 to x minus 1. Um, for, I, for x in range 3, is constructing a list and iterating across all the elements of that list. For val in my list, it iterates across each element of my list, setting val to each element in term. x range, um, as I mentioned earlier, yields the value um, without constructing the list. OK, so um, uh, sorry, this should say dictionaries up here. So I'm going to talk about um, dictionaries for a moment. Um, which is uh, uh, this way of um, having um, pairs, key value pairs um, in a data structure. So um, in order to create a dictionary, you use the curly brackets. So you say my dictionary equals um, open and close brackets. And you say um, insert in, you can insert into this dictionary by saying, OK, now the key is going to be 
the numeral 3, and the value is going to be this string 3. And the key here is the um, numeral uh, 4, and the value that you pair with that is the, the string FOUR, right? Um, you, can, uh, you can put whatever you want into a dictionary. This is just fine. You can mix keys of different types. So you can say um, 3 is the key for one of the elements, and then the string um, quote 3, or, or the string 3 is, is a key for a different one. So you can have this, um, uh, the value being the, the numeral 3. Uh, Similarly, you could have uh, another string and then have it, um, its value be a list. So again, there's, there's no strict typing here. You can interchange types of anything um, almost anywhere. Okay, so um, uh, if you wanted to iterate across a dictionary, so you, let's say you construct this dictionary, um, and you may recognize the syntax from the, the scans, like the core.source.settings files. Um, so you have this curly bracket, and then you say key, and then you say colon, and then you give it the value. So one colon, and then the string O-N-E, uh, comma, two colon, and then the string uh, T-W-O. This should be a, a close quote here. And then comma, and then three colon, um, quote, T-H-R-E-E, -E, uh, end quote. Right? So that, that would construct a dictionary. And then you can ask for all of the keys out of the dictionary with this keys function. So you say for key in um, my dictionary dot keys. Um, and then say print the, the key and then the value. So you can access the value by using the, the bracket operator, sort of treating it as if it were an array. Um, and then this will give you the numeral 1 in the string 1, the numeral 2 in the string 2, and the numeral 3 in the string 3. Um, similarly, you can, uh, you can uh, pull out key value pairs as little tuples or, or assign them uh, together here. So um, by, by asking for the iter items uh, function from the dictionary. And then you can print the key and value pairs, and they come out um, like this. Yeah? How is uh, iter items different from keys? Um, I usually use keys, but. Um. Yeah, so um, keys gives you uh, one item at a time, and this gives you a tuple, oh. which is the key and the value. That's cool. Yeah. Um, one, one brief like key saving thing is that I think in. Uh, say, at least in, in Python 2.6, you don't need the dot keys. You can just say for key in my dictionary. Yeah. Uh, okay, functions. So uh, the syntax for declaring a function is that you say you're, you're defining uh, your function, and you say um, you don't give a return type the way you would in C++. Usually you say, like, string, my function, and then you give the, the argument list. Instead, so you just say, I'm, I'm declaring a function. Um, and it's going to take um, some arguments. So you'd put them in parentheses and you'd separate them with commas. But you don't declare the, the type of your arguments either. So again, no typing in, in, uh, in Pythons. Then you give a, a colon, and then you start indenting. So in this, in this function, let's say the first line of the function is that you print uh, the first argument. And then the second uh, line of this function is that, um, and it's indented to the same level as the line that precedes it. Um, uh, you take the difference between argument 2 and argument 1. And then that's what you return from this function. Um, so how would you do Fibonacci in Python? So you could do um, uh, fib. Um, you give it the, the nth position in this that you want, v1 and v2. And you could assert that n is greater than 1. If n equals 1, so this assert statement, by the way, um, uh, is, is great for figuring out where your Python script has bugs. So put asserts um, where you see them. They're, they're always executed. But then again, you're probably not running Python for the sake of speed. You're just trying to get stuff done. Um, OK, so, um, so if n equals 1, then go ahead and return the v1, the starting point, the first of the uh, two values that you start your Fibonacci sequence from. If it's, uh, then this is the elif construct. Um, so this is the alternative to this if. So if this clause failed, then otherwise uh, compare against um, n equals 0. Uh, and return v2. I think this is a typo. I think I meant to say um, in the opposite order if n equals uh, 2 here. Um, and then uh, otherwise return the sum of um, fib on n minus 1 and n minus 2. Um, if you wanted to create an iterative version of this, uh, uh, you could similarly uh, say assert that n equals greater than 1. Um, and then uh, 
you would say construct a list uh, that's of the right length. Um, so this would save a little bit of uh, uh, computational time in, in copying your list. So I'm just sort of allocating this this array, this list at this um, at once at the beginning. Um, and I want it to have this size of n, so I'll just use the range function because that's convenient. Um, and then you can um, fill in the zeroth position of the list with uh, v1, the uh, oneth position of the list with v2, and then uh, iterate for i and x range from 2 to n, um, setting fib val sub i equals fib vals i minus 1 plus fib vals i minus 2. And then you can return fib vals n minus 1. Why did you choose to use the insert statement there and not like the if? Um, I guess I'm expecting that if somebody calls um, fib or fib iter and then uh, gives me the negative 12th position, that they messed up and they don't want to continue any further. Um, okay, so um, uh, one little thing is that um, you, so your variables, they can point to integers, and then you can change that variable and have it point to a string. Python's fine with that. You can also have a variable that points to a function. So you can define a function. So you said def my func in val, and say that the contents of this function is just to print that val. Um, then you can say, um, uh, and you have to hit enter again, um, func my var equals my func. So this is now a pointer to a function, and you can now call this function, uh, giving it, so you can call your variable as if it were a function and give it a value, and it will execute that function, which in this case will um, print the next um, item in, given, say, you have four. Um, and you can even um, create functions that, um, that don't have names and then assign them to variables, or um, often this is really useful if you want to pass a function into another function and have that function execute your function. And so these are called lambda functions. And so you just give like the arguments to your lambda function. The syntax is a little funny. So lambda, you always have to type out. And then you say um, the arguments. So you could say x is just one argument. If you had multiple arguments, you could say x comma y. And then, um, then you type out what is returned by this lambda function. So in this case, I've, I've got a little function that returns um, uh, x plus 1. Yeah? Um, that's a typo. Yeah, good catch. You don't say int val. I'm just um, uh, a habitual uh, C++er. Um, so uh, yeah, so, uh, so in this case, I'll, I'll I create this lambda function. I assign it to my variable sum func. And then I can um, uh, treat it as if it were a function by calling it. Uh, you know, so I say f I pass four to it using uh, the parentheses operator here, and I print the re return type, and that'll give me five. Um, okay, so um, uh, I'm going to say just a little bit about um, classes in Python. Um, I don't uh, for the for the actually you'll you will be using um, the, there's sort of two parts to the lab that's associated with this. Um, one where you're probably not going to be using classes, and the second where um, you'll be interacting with some classes that I'm providing for you. Um, so let me just uh, give you just a, a little bit of uh, a description of what it looks like when you're working with a class. So you say um, class, and then you name your class, and then you um, put a colon, and then you start indenting. All right, so I'll put three spaces here, and then I'm going to define a whole bunch of functions for my class. So um, the first one is uh, um, this underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. So this is, this is the constructor for your class. Um, in Python, you can only have one constructor. In um, C++, I think you can have, I mean, you can have lots in construct, um, of constructors in C++, I'm sure of that. I'm moderately certain you can only have one constructor in Python. Um, uh, and then you give the arguments for the constructor. In this case, it'll be uh, sort of an empty constructor. Um, and so you just give the self argument. So self is kind of a funny thing. This is, this is like the this pointer in C++. It's the object that you're operating on. Um, and you always have to pass it as an argument um, uh, when you declare the function. Um, but as, as we'll see in just a little bit, you don't pass self as an argument to the function. Um, maybe that'll be clear in just a moment. OK, so, so self is the argument. And I'm going to modify self. So I say self.count equals 0, self.stack equals list, or this is an empty list. OK, so um, actually what I'm creating here is a stack. Um, and, uh, and it's going to have two functions, push and pop. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. So this stack, it's going to have um, 
uh, a variable member count, uh, and um, I'll set that initially to zero because I've got an empty stack, and it's got this, um, this stack, which is this list. Um, and the two functions then are, are push and pop. So I'll push a value onto my stack by calling self.stack.append, right, because I can use the append function of the, of the list, and I'll put the value there. And then I'll say self.count plus equals negative one. Um, right, then the, um, uh, uh, well, yeah, so um, the last, the, the other function is pop. Um, and uh, with pop, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to um, give it any argument besides uh, the class itself. Um, I'm going to make sure that uh, self.count is greater than zero. You can't pop an empty stack. Um, and if it is greater than zero, then I'm going to decrement. Um, this should be minus equals one. Um, so self.count, uh, so you decrement um, count, and then, uh, and then you return um, the result of uh, stack.pop. So um, list itself will let you pop off the last element in a list, um, and then shrink, that, shrink the list so it has one fewer elements in it. Um, so basically, I've created a little wrapper around a list. And the list is doing all of the heavy lifting here. So it's doing both the append and the pop for me. Um, and so this is going to return what's returned by this function um, so that you can get, say, the last value that was on the stack. So if you were, say, interacting with your class, you say um, mc equals my class, and then you give an open and cl close quotes. Oh, I'm sorry, um, parentheses. So that's, that's basically the equivalent of new in C++. mc is a reference to my class. Um, or a pointer to it. Um, you don't actually use the word new, but that's what's going on here. It's creating a new instance of my class. And you can say mc.push10. So if we compare mc, uh, so this, this um, use of the, the function push with its declaration, you see that I'm passing in only a single parameter, even though in the declaration I say that there should be two parameters. And, and the difference is that mc is self. So it's kind of just pulling off MC and pushing that into self, and then val is, is the second argument, or the only one given in this case. So that's like the, the funny syntax of working with classes, is that you have to say self here when you're declaring the function, but you don't say self when you're calling a function. So you can, um, uh, so you can um, what's my val? Oh, so this should, this should say MC.count. So you can print um, the count. Uh, and, and just access that piece of private data, or what you might have thought of as private data, um, just on its own. And you can call, say, you can um, pop a value and print the value that's returned. In this case, since 11 was the last thing that was pushed onto the stack, it would um, print 11. Um, you can change the private uh, data in the class, um, and, uh, and that would, say, corrupt the integrity of this class. So watch out for doing that. So, um, so I should correct this um, so it's a little more clear. Um, I, I kind of did a little half editing of this slides where I, I renamed some values. So count, and then um, count equals zero. Uh, okay, so um, so you can print the count. The, the number of things in your stack that, that's sort of being kept up to date when you call push and pop. Um, and you can, you can change your class's private data. Um, that's a bad idea for this reason. So at this point, um, stack contains 10, because I've popped 11 off of it. But I've set the count to 0. Now if you look at the execution of pop, then it's, good, it's not going to give you 10 back. It's, it's actually not going to return anything. And so what this will do is print none. So if you don't return a val from a function, it actually returns none. And then you try to print none, and it'll just say none. Um, none is the null pointer. Um, uh, yeah. OK, so um, yeah, take away uh, funny syntax, um, special names for things. Um, you always have to pass self. Um, and you can mess up your classes if you start mucking around with their um, private data. And Python won't stop you. Um, all right, so um, for this lab, uh, one of the things I really like about Python, it makes it really easy to work with strings and files. Um, people like that about Perl, too, but you can't ever read Perl. Um, so with Python, you can write a, um, a piece of code and then read it later when you're curious about what it was supposed to have do been doing. Um, 
Okay, so uh, so the open function you can give it um, a file name, and uh, and an IO status string. Um, so the file name that's that's the string representing the file you wish to open. It can be either like uh, a relative path or it can be an absolute path. Um, IO status that's going to be um, a string representing read, write, or append, and you do that with the R, the W, or the A um, string. So if you um, so you'd say my file comma a and that would open up the file and start writing to so it could you could write to it but it would start writing at the end of the file um, and uh, and if you don't give um, any IO status then it assumes that you want to just read the file um, so you can just say open my file um, and then end, end quote oh, I'm sorry end parentheses and, and it will um, do that so um, there's a default value for IO status so for instance, if you, if you say f equals open blah.txt, then you have this file object um, uh, pointing at blah.txt, and it's in read mode. Um, I really like just getting all the lines out of a file at once, um, and then operating on the lines of the file. So I use this function readlines, which is defined for the, the file object. Um, and it returns a list of strings representing the contents of the file, um, one string per line, um, and then uh, the little bit of funny business there is that that string um, has the new line character at the end of it. Um, so if you print that line, it'll, uh, if you say print line, uh, then it will give you the line and then it will print the new line character and then print um, on its own will print an extra new line. And so that would make, so if you had like um, some dense text, uh, you would double space it if you print it out to the screen. Um, and the way to, to avoid that is that if you, if you call print and then um, you have this comma here at the end, then it won't print the, the new line that's associated with print. Um, okay, so how does this work? So it can say lines equals open blah.txt.readlines. So that creates an, uh, a list with all of the strings in the file. And then I can iterate across all the lines in the file. So for line in lines, print line, comma. So this would just say open a file and print it to the screen. Um, you can also do dot strip. You can do dot strip, yeah. Um, I don't know if I cover strip in the string manipulation, but I'm getting to string manipulation in just a second. Um, very soon. Um, so, okay, uh, one of my favorite functions is split. So you can say um, uh, line.split, and um, then you give it this delimiter uh, that you want to split by. So if you had uh, a line that um, was like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you split it on the letter C, then it would give you A, B, and then uh, second thing, this is D, E, F, G. Um, so you can split on whatever character you want, whatever string you want, um, uh, or you could use the default, which is just a space. So if you have my string um, four score and seven years ago and you split it, then you get a list of um, four score and seven years ago. Um, one element in this list for each word in this, in this line. Um, you can split on a string, so if you split it on um, uh, and, for instance, the string and, and you have four score space, and then a second string space seven years ago. Um, you can, um, so the, one of the things that's um, frustrating about split is that uh, right, it gives you a list, and then maybe you want to assume that that list is of a certain length, um, and uh, if your delimiter isn't there, then that would be a faulty assumption. Um, uh, so partition has this nice property that um, it returns a three tuple of strings. So if you partition on the word years, then it'll give you four score and seven space, and then years as this, the, um, the bracket one element, or the second element in this tuple, and then space ago as, as the third element. And regardless of what you search for, you're always going to get a three tuple. So you can always look in, in position two of that array, or position zero of that array, uh, of that tuple, excuse me. Um, for instance, if you if you partition on my string dot part, uh, if you call my string dot partition and you give it the word absent, you get a three tuple again, four score and seven years ago being the first string in this three tuple, an empty string for the um, thing that you tried to partition on, and an empty string for the final portion of the partition. Um, for instance, if you wanted to um, uh, find all the pound includes in a file then this is a very simple way of getting all of that out. So here's the, the f name, and I'm going to define this function findIncludes. Um, first thing I do is I declare this list, 
call it includes. And then I'll open the, the, the file and read all the lines out of it and put it in lines. So OK, now I'm going to iterate across all the lines of this file. And I'll say, for line and lines, I'll split it into columns. Calls equals line.split. And so now I have uh, an, uh, a list of strings um, that's split by, by white space. Um, so I'll look at the first element of this list and see if it equals pound include. All right, so that's how I figure out if, I, if I'm looking at a pound include line. Um, uh, and then if it is, then the next thing is the file that I want. But it either has these um, uh, um, pointy brackets or it has um, uh, a quote around it. So I want to strip those off and get just the file name. Um, so I can ask for the next element calls one. So that's the string that I want. And then I'll strip off the zero position and the last position by, by indexing from one to negative one. Um, and then that's one of the includes that I want. And I'll append it to my list, and I stop indenting, so I leave this if clause, I leave this for clause, and I'll just return the, the includes that I've uh, called this way. Um, and so this is a, this is a really short um, script, right, or a, piece, or a function here to do something that in C++ would, um, would take you a fair amount of effort. Yeah? The, uh, it has to do with um, trying to resolve uh, which thing you're trying to include. Um, and so it, um, with the, uh, the angle brackets, you have, to, um, you have to give the path relative to one of the dash i directories uh, that you give G++. So um, in our, in our uh, uh, G++ command, um, we say lots of things, but it'll say like um, G++. Um, some things like this is be the name of the out file, and you say dash i um, src. Um, so it knows to look in the src directory to um, uh, to start searching for things. So then when you when you pound include um, uh, core pose pose dot hh, then uh, it'll search for something that matches this in that path. Um, if you use uh, square brackets, let's say, so this, is, this could be like um, uh, from devel uh, somewhere. Um, and then if you had another one that was, um, uh, excuse me, from uh, core pose, like you have like a, let's say, uh, util dot, excuse me, util dot hh. Right, you could do something like pound include pose.hh. And it would, G, G++ would look for pose.hh in the current path of the thing that it's compiling. And that's, um, it's, it's just a little bit trickier to work with this, especially if you want to um, move uh, files from one directory to another. Um, and so that's why we prefer that you have like just the um, the angle brackets. Um, and then I'll apologize that this script would get a little bit more complicated if I, if I started thinking about white space here um, so that uh, this is actually a legal pound include. You don't need a space between the pound include and the thing that you're pound including. Um, I don't like that, um, but uh, it, is, it is legal. Uh, we encourage people to have a space between it. It makes, it, makes my life a lot easier. Um, uh, you could also have white space out in front of this as well. Um, I think that would be handled because it would trim off the white space uh, in this case. Okay, so um, uh, here's, a, here's an example of how you might go about replacing um, all occurrences of the word testing with training in some file. Um, so if you have... Uh, um, this file replace function, you could give it, um, uh, you could write it so that uh, it takes a file name, um, the original string like testing and the uh, replacement string like training. You open the lines, or open the file and read the lines and put that in lines. And you create this, new, this variable new lines, um, which is this uh, empty list. And you can iterate across all the lines in the file um, and, and say new lines that append line.replace original comma replacement. So string actually gives you this, um, a uh, nice function called replace, where you give it two arguments, the original and the replacement, and it will give you a new string, 
It doesn't modify the original string. It gives you a new string um, that then uh, uh, you can append to your list. Um, and then you can open the file again in the write status and call write lines um, and then give that the new lines that you've just created. So that's a way to replace everything in a file um, in, in like six lines. Yeah? I have a question about something you said earlier. Uh, so you mentioned like there's no prime data. So, mm -hmm. so you can just do whatever it was, this dot, uh, or the class dot, my value equals whatever you want. How is that so different from if you just have a, a setter? You know? The setter um, is a gate, right? Um, and so, uh, so for instance, in confirmation, you have like set x, y, z. Um, and behind the scenes, confirmation says, oh, you want to change the XYZ of that register? That's fine. You're going to do that. But I'm also going to write down the fact that you did so. So the next time you ask for a torsion, I know to tell the atom tree that it needs to update its torsions from the coordinates. And so it'll call this like sort of complicated process. Um, but it, it also delays that, um, that process until you actually do want a, a torsion. So if you're going to set a lot of XYZs, then it will only call one thing. So, um, you can imagine it this way. So you start writing your class, and you say set x, y, z, and um, uh, you just have it set the x, y, z. And then you think, oh, man, this is going to be really slow because uh, you know, I'm going to be calling this um, atom tree update for every time somebody calls set x, y, z. That's going to really you know, kill my performance. I wish I had a lazy update mechanism. It's too bad there are now 2 million lines of code that are um, interacting with set x, y, z. And then you remember, oh, you, you have a setter, so you can change the implementation of that setter okay. without having to change any of the two millions of lines of code that depend on it. Right, right. Um, and then you, you, you sort of sneak in the lazy update that way. Okay. So having a setter, instead of having public data, means that um, you, it's, a, it's a way of future-proofing um, the better ideas that you're going to have in the future. Like You're going to say, there's a better way for me to do this. I can preserve the existing interface. I don't have to change things. Okay. That's, um, that's a feature of Python that I wasn't aware of, but that's cool. OK, that's it. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the lab. Um, if you've been looking at it earlier this morning, it's, it's gotten a little more verbose, so you can read through um, some of the extra things that I added for it. Um, it's the same task, but uh, there's more description of how, how we, you would go about doing it. Um, you don't manage memory in Python. Python manages it for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's doing a reference count thing behind the scenes. I think it's a combination reference count garbage collection, but I'm not 100% certain of that. So when you declare a variable, for example, how much memory does it allocate? Because you said